Congress uh, for NBC News and Washington in general, the D.C. Police Chief Charles Ramsey said tonight, nothing in Washington, D.C., your nation's capital, is likely to be the same again. That's the police chief of that city. But as far as security is concerned, there is no longer any such thing, he said, as business as usual. Already Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House had been closed down. There had been some talk about reopening that. That talk will disappear in a heartbeat as a result of this attack on the Pentagon today and the terrorist attack up here in New York City. What goes on in a cockpit when there's the kind of chaos that we witnessed here today? Well, someone who knows a lot about cockpit chaos in a flight that is in a distressed mode is Al Haynes. He was the man who was at the controls of that United Airlines flight in July 1989 and made that heroic controlled crash landing in Sioux City, Iowa and saved so many lives with his heroic action. Let's talk to you, Mr. Haynes. You were not being hijacked at the time, obviously, but what must what it must have been like in that cockpit? You had to be thinking about that today as you watched all these images. Yeah, Tom, I, I can't imagine what those that crew went through. I, I have to believe, like everybody else has been saying all day, that the crew only had control of the airplane from the very beginning, and after that it had to be someone else. No crew would do what those people did. Yeah, uh, what they went through had to be terrible. And they were obviously very sophisticated, uh, the hijackers, because they knew enough to turn off the transponder so no one could track their flight. Oh, I hadn't heard that. They did turn the transponder off. Yeah. Yes. And if Well, that, that would be... Go ahead. Excuse me, they can, they can track them by the blip, but they would have just a, a blip to follow, and it would be very difficult for the controllers, I would think, to follow. Yeah. What are the procedures in a cockpit if you are being hijacked? How are you trained as a pilot? Well, you have, you have several different things you can do. One is you do send out a transponder code, but obviously they knew better than that. And that's about it. There's not much else you can do. Uh, you send the transponder code, and if they won't let you transmit on the radio, uh, then you're just there, and that's all there is to it. Is there any other way to send a secret signal to air traffic controllers uh, that you're being hijacked? Not, not unless you use a transponder. Other than that, there's, there's really no way to contact them other than by radio. Uh, and if they know enough to turn the transponder off, I'm sure they won't let you talk. Once you get airborne in a uh, 757 or whatever these planes uh, were today, how difficult would it be for someone to remove the pilot from the chair and take the controls and fly it as precisely as they did? into the Pentagon and into the World Trade Center? Well, um, I, would, I would just guess here, speculation, that once they're in the cockpit, uh, they probably know enough to put it on autopilot. They put it on autopilot, then they pull the crew out of the seats by either executing them or making them unconscious, and then they can get back in and fly. But first it would go on autopilot, so the airplane would be under control while they were doing this. And they probably know enough to do that, evidently, if they know enough to turn it off the transponder. That'd be a guess anyway. Yeah, but they made a hard left turn when they left Boston, according to the blip that we were able to follow on the, uh, on the tracking tape, and then they were able to make a couple of banking turns at low altitude here over uh, Manhattan, and I think that there was at least one report that they did the same thing over Washington, D.C., perhaps over Lafayette Park. So it does appear that the people who were at the controls were skilled pilots, and if they were the terrorists, they were obviously highly trained. Well, it's also possible that they hijacked the airplane before it took off. I'm just, again, a wild guess, so that they were actually in the cockpit at the takeoff. And uh, if you know that uh, the one down in the Caribbean that crashed, the hijacker was in the right seat while the captain was in the left seat. It's possible if he thinks they're just going to hijack the airplane, you'll do whatever they say. And if he says, I'm going to sit in this right seat, you take off, that's what you do because you assume he's just going to go somewhere and land and refuel and that type of thing. How difficult has this day been for you watching? these planes being flown uh, in the buildings and the Pentagon? Uh, it, it, was, it was difficult at first, uh, especially when I found out there were crews involved. And when I found it was united, it was even more so. But uh, it, the whole thing has been very difficult. I have been busy most of the day and haven't seen an awful lot of it. But uh, what I have seen is just, as the word everybody uses, horrific. And it, it, it's, it's a very emotional thing for, for anyone. Al Haynes, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, it still was a marvel of uh, piloting that you did when you landed that plane in Sioux City, Iowa, that United Airlines plane that had lost most of its controls, and he was able to bring it in in a controlled crash landing. They did lose some of the passengers, obviously, but uh, any number of them were saved as a result of his great skills in the cockpit. We want to show you some remarkable scenes now from inside Air Force One. Uh, this is the uh, fighter jet escort that Air Force, had, Air Force One had as it flew back to Washington today from the Strategic Air Command headquarters 
at Offutt Air Force Base. That may become a routine procedure for the president as he flies uh, domestically in this country as well as internationally. The help of, of, of some rogue state. He probably did, you know. Uh, a bad analogy, but I'll use it. A lot of times uh, somebody else does it, but the CIA funnels the money, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's very possible that Iraq, uh, or even Iran, even Iran, uh, could have done this, and uh, not done it, but used these guys as their surrogates. Very, very possible, yes. Don, let me ask you, what's the, what are the odds that they had inside help? We've heard that mentioned at least once this morning, that perhaps they had some help from the inside, especially at, at the airports by some of the workers. Is there any chance of that? It's a chance, ma'am, but you know, and this is bad. You, we're giving them a bad name, the poor workers. You know, this is a 6 $7 hour job or whatever they get. Uh, they're looking at 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 people in a row. I, I, my point was that, yeah, there's an odds that they were, but there's also odds that they just got Because you remember, they didn't use uh, uh, guns. They used knives, and, and you could hide those a little bit better. You know, you, you go through with knives. I know, uh, you know, they'll stop you sometime, an umbrella, a knives, and you can, you can hide those a lot better than you can a gun. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it very much. Uh, that is Dan Goldstein, University of Pittsburgh military expert. We do have word now that Greyhound has resumed intercity bus service throughout much of the nation uh, today, uh, a, a few hours after they canceled service following the wave of terrorist attacks. Uh, the bus company canceled all service along uh, the northeast of a line from Cleveland to Columbus, Ohio, Charleston, West Virginia, and Richmond and Norfolk in Virginia. All bus service has resumed except for New York City, Newark, New Jersey, Washington, and Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. Yesterday's course of events is said to rival, if not exceed, the tragedy of Pearl Harbor. Right now, we want to bring you up to date on the chain of tragedies which developed yesterday. Around 845 yesterday morning, of course, American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. As you can see from this, oh, this video, the plane struck the top of the building, causing a massive explosion and hole. American Airlines Flight 11 was the first of two airplanes to strike the World Trade Center. The Boeing 767 was en route from Boston to Los Angeles, carried 81 passengers, nine flight attendants, and two pilots. 18 minutes later at 9.03, a second plane, United Flight 175, crashed into the south tower of the World Trade Center. The airplane slicing through the building, setting off again another huge explosion that later would level the tower. United Flight 175, also a Boeing 767, was en route from Boston to Los Angeles. That flight was carrying 56 passengers, seven flight attendants, and two pilots. Then at about 9.40, American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. The nerve center of the nation's military burst into flames and a portion of the building crumbled to the ground. And also American Airlines Flight 77, a Boeing 757, left Washington, D.C., heading to Los Angeles. On that flight were 58 passengers, four flight attendants, and two pilots. Then the trail of terror hit closer to home at 10 a.m. United Airlines Flight 93, a Boeing 757, crashed in Stony Creek Township, Somerset County. Two minutes before the plane went down, a passenger called the 911 Operation Center in Greensburg from the bathroom of the airplane. Then the phone cut off. The powerful impact of the crash left behind a massive crater in the ground. Debris scattered everywhere, the biggest piece five feet long. Investigators still on the scene. That plane was carrying 38 passengers, two pilots, five flight attendants, crashed in Stony Creek just outside of Shanksville along Lambertsville Road. The plane had been hijacked on its way from Newark to San Francisco. Back in New York, more devastation at the World Trade Center. The two towers, which were attacked within 18 minutes of one another, had collapsed. The top of the building exploded. The dust and debris so thick it blocked out the sun. Nearly 50,000 people worked in the buildings. Thousands more visited those towers daily. The number of casualties now being predicted in the thousands. Of course, a lot of people headed back to work today, and unfortunately, we do have an accident to report to you on the Parkway West. Let's get the latest now from Cantina Forte. Why are we here? Move over there. We're apparently having some problems establishing audio with uh, Jessica Borg. We will get back to her in Somerset County, the scene of a, of a United Airlines crash uh, with 45 people on board yesterday. A plane that was apparently uh, heading to um, reports, unofficial uh, reports yeah. at this point, heading to Camp David, but crashed in, in the woods of Somerset County. Yes. All right, we have uh, John Delano is here with some expert analysis. 646 now, and the attack on America, certainly a trying time for the nation. Yeah, it's going to be a real test of President Bush's leadership. And John, you uh, are in the newsroom right now. 
What's your take on what has happened and, and how things are being handled? Well, you know, uh, Bruce and Susan, we all watched, of course, as you say, President Bush last night. I thought he did an excellent job. He did exactly what you expect the Commander-in-Chief and the President of the United States to do, calm, really with great resolve, pointing out that this country goes on. And today we will see how we go on. We will go on because we will return to work in most parts of this country, and we will carry on business, hopefully, as usual in the financial sense, if not in the personal sense of the tragedy of the losses that we've experienced. Now, John, you had a, a very unique experience in Harrisburg yesterday. Tell us about that. Well, actually, I don't know how unique it was. I just happened to be in, in uh, Harrisburg on some unrelated business, and I was in a meeting with a member of the governor's cabinet uh, yesterday morning, and all of a sudden he gets a telephone call on his cell phone and apologizes and says he has to leave. And then in a few minutes later, he's back saying, look, we're shutting down state government. At that point, I raced immediately over to the uh, state capitol building where I discovered that the governor, who was in Erie yesterday morning, had essentially ordered the evacuation of the entire state capitol complex, not only at the capitol building, but also the individual state offices. Uh, I had bumped into the governor's press people, for example, as they were racing out of the capitol building. All of this heightened security, of course, was exactly the right thing you do when you don't know whether the attacks on Washington and really on New York City were limited or whether they could have been at an other state capitals around the country. We learned uh, from the Associated Press a short time ago, John, that the president has called congressional leaders to the White House this morning apparently to strategize what they're going to do next. Is it important to, to strike back, get retaliation, show America is strong, or is it better to sit back try to find out the, the intended target and then go from there. Well, you know, that's going to be the point of dispute, if there is any at all, among policymakers. But I think at this point, what is absolutely clear is that everyone is united behind President Bush. Republicans, Democrats, independents, it doesn't matter who you are. This tragedy hit at all of us. And the leadership of both parties last night stood together on the Capitol steps, made it quite clear that government is going on today. They are convening Congress. They will pass a resolution today showing full support for the president. Determining precisely how to react to this is something that you're going to have matters of opinions. But the president made it quite clear that this is not going to be business as usual in the sense that in the old days where we might want to just go right after the terrorists responsible, I thought the president made it quite clear that this time we not only hold the terrorists responsible, but those governments, those countries that are harboring terrorism and terrorists, they too will be targets. So, you know, we don't know what's going to happen here, but you can be sure there's going to be an awful lot of discussion privately in Washington today. All right, John Delano, of course, the most difficult part about this is determining exactly who the enemy is, who the terrorist is responsible for this. That will be done uh, by our nation's leaders. John Delano, thank you. All right, 6.49 now. Now, one of those hijacked planes that crashed in a remote area crashed in Somerset County. Yeah, 45 people are presumed dead there. Jessica Borg is live now in Shanksville, Somerset County with the very latest. Jess. Bruce, Susan, I can hear you now. That's right, 45 people uh, presumed dead in this crash, 38 passengers, five flight attendants, and two pilots. Now, it's the light of day now. Very shortly, this investigation will resume. Uh, very shortly, scores of FBI agents, uh, uh, forensic experts, and local and state officials will be here, including FAA officials, who will be converging on the crash site to uh, sift through more evidence. There are a couple of things that they're going to do today that I want to mention. First, they're going to divide the crash site into a grid to search for evidence more efficiently and more effectively. They're also going to try to recover those black boxes, the plane's flight recordings, which will give an indication to investigators what exactly happened shortly before this uh, fiery crash into this rural part of Somerset County, the patterns and behavior of the plane before it uh, landed here in Somerset County. Also, it will give an indication to investigators about the kinds of conversations had in the cockpit. According to the FBI, they will also uh, begin the gruesome task of body identification, though we want to point out, as pictures indicate, that they're really 
are very little signs of life here in this part of Pennsylvania. Really just uh, shards of metal as a result of the crash of this Boeing 757 landing here. The 40 foot deep crater that we've been showing you since last night and some clothing strewn about on trees. Now as we await more and more officials to arrive here we do have a Red Cross official here. I'd like to introduce uh, Major Roger Carney uh, from Johnstown. Uh, what exactly is your role here this morning and throughout the day? We're here to uh, provide uh, physical assistance to all the folks that will be doing whatever they do today, uh, giving them sandwiches and drinks, hot drinks, cold drinks, providing them with just the normal basic support while they're doing uh, their duties during this time. I should say you're from the Salvation Ar Army, sorry, Major, not Red Cross. Um, so that will be your role today. You mentioned that you've been on the site of a terrible floods, assisting families in. How is this different? Uh, this is different because of the, the mass tragedy that has taken place. Uh, homes and personal properties were lost in the flood. Here, lives have been destroyed. And not only those unfortunate folks that were killed in the airplane crash, but the families that are left behind, it will be devastating. There will be a great deal of recovery necessary. And, and so many lives have been uh, touched with this tra tragedy. One of the things we're told by officials is that the relatives and family and friends, uh, family I should say, of the victims here um, are invited to come to this site. We understand that officials have offered to transport them from Jones, Johnstown should they have a need to come here, should they want to come here to see this site for, for closure. We understand that you will be assisting those families or providing services as far as assisting them with this uh, absolute trauma. Whatever we're called upon, we will certainly try to do. Uh, we're there uh, not only for the folks doing the work here, but the families. Uh, some of them are going to need us to talk with them, uh, be there just to give them a hug. And, and needless to say, uh, hearts are broken. And so uh, if we can give them any type of comfort during this tragedy, that's what we're there for. And how many of your people do you have out of here this morning? We've, we've had approximately 40 the whole time. Uh, we're working in shifts, and we'll change our shifts around 8 a.m. this morning. Uh, we've had five canteens from the different Salvation Army units throughout the Western Pennsylvania Division. Major Carney, thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. We know you've had a very busy time and a busy morning ahead of you. Thanks for making time for us. Uh, again, no confirmation that relatives have actually, uh, will actually come down here if any of them uh, have felt the need or expressed the desire to see the site here. Uh, we understand that at noon time today, there will be a press briefing by FBI officials who are leading this investigation on the progress of their investigation. We could hear from them much sooner than that. Again, it's the light of day now. Uh, this investigation is expected to resume very shortly. Just in these last couple of minutes or so, we've seen many more uh, federal officials arrive here. Their mission overnight to preserve and protect the crash site, preserving any and all evidence. Their mission now to sift through the evidence and try to find answers to the questions on their minds. Reporting live from Somerset County this morning, Jessica Bohr, KDK TV News. All right, Jess, thanks. And our Especially those who have lost loved ones or who are uncertain where their loved ones are at this hour. I'm Katie Couric. And I'm Matt Lauer. There's a look on people's faces in this city that's been there for about the past 20 hours now that I've never seen before, and I'm sure it's being repeated in Washington and in parts of Pennsylvania as well. This was the scene about 22 hours ago. As horrible as these pictures are of airplanes intentionally plunging into the World Trade Center, we still don't know how high the human toll will climb. The early numbers are staggering. 266 people on the four hijacked planes are dead. Two hit the twin towers of the World Trade Center. One hit the Pentagon and one crashed 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. At the Pentagon, up to 800 people now fear dead. In New York City, Mayor Rudy Giuliani says the toll could be more than any of us can bear. The New York Fire Commissioner said that he is missing 300 firefighters and EMS personnel. 33 New York police officers are missing. Estimates are that there were up to 50,000 people working in the World Trade Center on Tuesday morning when that attack took place. If, if there is a glimmer of hope, it's this. Word is that some victims have survived in Lower Manhattan. Police are getting cell phone calls coming from the rubble, and people still are being pulled out alive. At this point, there are two makeshift morgues being set up in Lower Manhattan. And there are also some heartbreaking reports of passengers on the doomed planes calling loved ones to report that they'd been hijacked 
and in some cases to say goodbye. We are beginning, Matt, to get a picture of the terror on those planes before they crash. Flight attendants being stabbed, passengers herded to the back of the planes. And now new developments overnight in Boston where two of the flights originated. Five suspects have been identified and a car seized from the Logan Airport parking lot. But there is still a lot we don't know and may not know for a long time. The president spoke to the nation last night. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. Let's begin with NBC's David Bloom, who's close to the rescue efforts this morning. David, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. The firefighters, the police officers, the rescue workers who've been laboring all night here in Lower Manhattan tell us, now that they have daybreak, that they confront three basic problems. Number one, there are still fires burning here in Lower Manhattan. If you look behind me, you can see some of the smoke that's still billowing out of what remains of the World Trade Centers as we look south here on West Broadway. But you can also see the fire hoses 22 hours after the first explosion still spraying water on the buildings. Problem number two is that there are buildings that they still fear will collapse. Of course, what you have is three major structures that have already collapsed, but the great fear is that more buildings have been severely damaged. The third problem is that there's just so much debris that they cannot mount a serious rescue effort. They're in some caverns, the firefighters tell us, looking for survivors, but it is a cruelly slow process. Overnight in New York City, a faint glimmer of hope. At least two victims pulled alive from the rubble. And there may be others still trapped inside the World Trade Center's collapsed remains. Reports of cell phone calls from a few survivors pleading for help. We do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. We're very hopeful, very hopeful that there are pockets where there are people, not, not only the ones that we know about, but ho hopefully others. But elsewhere, the news is grim. The president last night puts the death toll from the attacks in the thousands after an estimated 12 to 20 terrorists wielding makeshift knives hijack four domestic airliners. Brand new video obtained overnight shows the first attack plane crashing into the World Trade Center's North Tower. Minutes later, television helicopters record the second plane crashing into the South Tower. The two 110-story buildings so badly damaged that they collapse, one after the other. Among the missing, the rescuers themselves. Last night, New York City firefighters and police confirm that more than 300 of their own are believed dead. And at the Pentagon, site of the third plane attack, Firefighters last night say the death toll could rise to as high as 800 people. Last night, Air Force One, escorted by two fighter jets, returns President Bush to Washington, where he brands the attacks evil and despicable, vowing that America will win the war against terrorism. With Saudi-born terrorist Osama bin Laden the prime suspect, Mr. Bush makes a thinly veiled threat of reprisal against his backers in Afghanistan. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. The two hijacked planes which toppled the World Trade Center both originated out of Boston, where this morning the Boston Herald reports that authorities have identified at least five Arab men as suspects, one of them a trained pilot, and that a car laden with Arabic language flight training manuals was found at Logan Airport's central parking garage. As to bin Laden's suspected role, Senator Orrin Hatch tells the Associated Press that the United States intercepted communications between bin Laden supporters discussing targets that were hit, and that at least one of the suspected hijackers had known ties to the terrorists. One of the biggest mysteries, why did the fourth hijacked plane not hit a target, crashing instead in western Pennsylvania? One possible explanation, a passenger on the doomed flight reportedly called his wife, telling her, we're all going to die. 
I love you, but indicating that he and two other passengers had decided to try to overpower the hijackers. Attorney General John Ashcroft told Congress last night that that plane is believed to have been headed for Washington, D.C. Matt, it probably goes without saying that the financial markets here in New York will remain closed today. Airports around the country will remain shut down until at least noon Eastern time. The president plans to meet with his national security team later this morning. Matt. All right, David Bloom in Lower Manhattan this morning. David, thank you very much. Eight past the hour, here's Katie. Matt, thank you. The scene on the ground at the World Trade Center at 9 a.m. Tuesday morning was chaotic, to say the least. Michael George was sitting at his desk on the 33rd floor in two World Trade Center, and David Reck was on the street below when the first plane crashed into the North Building. Michael and David, good morning. Thank good you morning. so much for being here. We appreciate it. David, let me start with you. You were on the street passing out pamphlets, is that right, sir? Yesterday campaign literature? Was, yesterday was supposed to be a primary election here in New York, and I was handing out campaign literature for candidates at a housing development in Tribeca just a few blocks north. And uh, about a quarter to nine, uh, we heard the roar of jet engines, and it was very loud, and the plane came in very low over Tribeca, and it made a slight turn and dove right into the upper part of the, the first tower. What was your reaction when that happened? Did you think a terrible accident had taken place? The first thing that happened, the, the street was loaded with people. Everything just froze. Everybody just stared at it in disbelief as if it wasn't real. And then lots of people started coming out of the buildings and just looking at the tower. And we were all talking about it all until the second plane hit. And here we have video of this was about 20 minutes later. And all yes. of a sudden, you see another jet crashing into the second twin tower. When that happened? And then uh, everybody, there was just total bedlam. Uh, people started coming out and going north on the streets. And there was a school, a grade school, just below us. And some of us went down. To, there were parents dropping off kids there to see if, it could, uh, if we could help. And it was just uh, bizarre. Was it bedlam on the streets at Total. that point? Were emergency crews were there? Were, were they instructing people to leave the area? No, the emergency crews were more headed uh, a block or two below us. You could hear the sirens everywhere. And you could see the vehicles move. And while we were at the school is when the first building collapsed, and, and then everyone in mass started heading north, walking up the streets. Uh, and as we were headed up through Tribeca, we could see military aircraft flying uh, down the river, and it was very strange, very strange. Michael, you were sitting at your desk. You, you work at, for Oppenheimer Funds. Right. You work in the second Twin Tower. <sighs> Correct. What did you hear when the first plane went through that building? The other um, twin tower. Yeah, you couldn't hear like the crashing of the plane. You just felt the rumbling and the shaking of the whole building. I mean, I think instantaneously everybody knew something was wrong. Uh, everybody within seconds went to the window, and you could just see uh, debris everywhere. It was like a ticker tape parade. I mean, there was just debris in the air. Um, and at that point, I just ran as did everybody else on my floor. We S took the steps. Yep. You were on the thirty-third floor. Third floor, right. And so you started evacuating. I understand when you got to the fourth floor, they made an announcement, which yeah. you ignored, thankfully. Yeah, there were no, um, you know, there were no fire alarms going. Um, people proceeded very calmly. Um, uh, where we were, we couldn't see the plane hit, but as other people from other sides of the building came over, we could, you know, you could hear bits and pieces of what happened. You heard a plane crash, and um, people continued to walk down very calmly. And then we got to around the fourth floor, an announcement came over the PA saying, you know, the accident is isolated in building one. There is no fire danger to building two. Um, and Return to your desk. I didn't hear that, but I just, that's what they said. Um, stay in the building. Um, and I mean, most people just continued going. I think most people disregarded that. Do you know anyone who went back to the, to no. the office? No, and I've been able to connect with uh, m most of the people um, at my company to, you know, determine that they got out. When you got down to the street level, um, were you in the area when the second plane hit the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just crossing the street. I just got out of the building, was walking across Liberty, and I didn't see anything, but I could just hear the, what I now know was a plane, but at the time didn't know, I mean, if it was a missile or what, but we heard the, the roaring of the engine and then the crashing into the building, the explosion, and um, I was just, you know, at that point, everybody just kind of went on their own, was running. We've heard the most harrowing stories of people witnessing individuals from the building who were on the upper floors, particularly at the yeah. first tower, mm -hmm. jumping to their desks. Mm -hmm. 
holding hands with other people. Yeah, I saw, I mean, when we came down on the steps, um, you could just look onto the, uh, the courtyard in between the two towers, and that's where a lot of the debris was. And my coworkers, as we saw, you know, you could see exactly what you, what you just said. It was awful. It was more than just a few people. There were a lot of people who were jumping. Some people have estimated 100 to 150 people jumping to I their deaths. I would say that's about right. Did you all sleep last night following this? I got exhausted, and I did sleep some last night. A couple hours with the TV on. And this morning when you woke up, I know, for example, David, that you live in the area. Yeah, I live uh, just above Canal. Did you see rescue workers? What was the, the, the atmosphere like this morning? Uh, since last night, uh, anything that's been moving down there has been heavy construction equipment and police vehicles and motorcades, police motorcades. But uh, right now, when I was walking out this morning, it's very quiet. It's a total opposite of what, what happened yesterday. There's virtually no one on the streets. The Holland Tunnel is closed. There's virtually no traffic down there. It's very different. You said that you had talked to people in your office and connected with the people who work for Oppenheimer. Yeah. So many people work at the World Trade Center. Absolutely. And so many of us know are afraid we might learn about someone we know who's unaccounted for at this point. I would just encourage anyone to call in and check in at least with uh, their companies because that might, you know, it's a good, good way to keep track of who was out there, maybe just hadn't connected yet. How about you? Do you know of anybody? I don't know. Personally, everyone, uh, we have a website up and running uh, at oppenheimerfunds.com, um, shareholder section for employees to log in and uh, you can see the list and everyone I saw who I knew was on the list. So that means I everyone's okay. I guess you all will never forget this day for the oh, rest of no your way. lives. It's I don't think any of us will. David it's the most Reckon. thing I've ever seen. Michael George, I'm glad both of you are safe this morning. Thank you for coming in. Appreciate thank you. Appreciate it, because I know you're probably exhausted as well. So thank you. It is 714. Now here's Matt. <coughs> all right, Katie, thank you. New York City's mayor is Rudolph Giuliani. Mayor Giuliani, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. I, I know you've spent an awful lot of town, uh, time down at the uh, scene of the destruction. Can you give me an idea of what you've seen so far? Uh, well, I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. I, I, I suspect uh, no one else has. Uh, the destruction is enormous. The debris is beyond uh, any, any description. And what we, have, what we have been doing in the last ten, uh, 10 or 12 hours is trying to get a focus on uh, each day the efforts that are going to need it. First, with the primary concern today being on saving human life and seeing if we can rescue uh, some more people. We've rescued two uh, in the or, or in the early morning hours, late, late evening, early morning hours. We have another person that we're focusing on right now that we're in contact with that we're hopefully going to be able to take out. And uh, so the, f the first concern, the first priority is can we rescue people that are actually still alive there? And, and Mayor the Giuliani... second part, of, obviously, is to, is, to clean up, uh, is to clean up the debris. Th there are reports that, that rescuers are receiving cell phone calls from people who may be trapped in the rubble. What can you tell me about that? that? Th the answer to that is yes, that, that has happened, and that, that assisted in being able to rescue the two Port Authority police officers that we've been able to rescue and the one man that we're in contact with. Uh, there have been cell phone calls, there have been cell phone communications. What I can't tell you and what we're not sure of because we're res responding to them is, is that all coming from the same source, the man that we're in contact with, or is it more than one? And we're hopeful that it's more than one. I, I want to talk to you about what, in, in my opinion, is one of the most horrendous parts of this story. Firefighters, police officers, emergency medical technicians rushing to the scene of this disaster getting close to the building, in some cases being inside the building when one of the towers or both of the towers collapsed. Talk to me about the toll this has taken on New York's firefighters and police. I, I don't think they realize yet uh, that that's something that we're going to have to deal with today and tomorrow as people absorb the impact of what's actually happened. We have, um, right now, the count is 202 firefighters that are missing. Uh, Altogether, 259 uniformed service members, meaning police officers and firefighters, New York City police officers, Port Authority police officers, the number two, number three uh, ranking officers in the fire department di died as a result of the collapse. Uh, so very, very heavy losses and, and uh, fatalities for our, for our fire department in particular, but also for our police department. 
Yeah, yesterday you said the, the death toll here may be beyond what we can bear. I, is there any way you can even begin to estimate how many people may be in that wreckage? Uh, the estimates are that there were thousands of people in the building at the time that it, at the time that it went down. And the, the question is how many were able to get out? There was a, a window of about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, depending on the building. There was a, that window for people to get out. I was there early in that process and saw a lot of people that got out. So th that's why the calculation is difficult. We don't, we don't know how many people were left in the building. But if we're, if we're thinking about the recovery effort and the plans that we have to make, we're assuming in the, in the thousands. And then, you know, maybe, maybe it won't be that high. But right now, in putting the efforts together yesterday for the medical examiner, for the recovery efforts, for the resources that we need, the help that we need from the state and the federal government. Uh, we're, we're, we're in the thousands in terms of what we think we're going to have to uh, deal with. I know that plans are in the works now to start to relieve some of the workers, the, the rescue people who've been on the scene for about 20 hours now. And I know that also a lot of them, the firefighters and police, don't want to leave because they, they, their brothers and sisters are still in that building. Yeah, uh, s s some of the people that we lost were um, were ve very, very well known. Uh, Bill Feehan is the first deputy commissioner of the fire department that I've appointed to that position. Bill has been with the fire department, I think, th 37 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Pete Gansey is the chief of the department. Uh, Father Michael Judge is uh, beloved in the fire department. He was a fire department chaplain. And 15 minutes before he died, I talked to him and asked him to pray, pray for us. And so. The, the, the men that we've lost in the fire department are, are all well known to the other firefighters and that's why they're there and the, the fire commissioner has sent as many of them home as, a home as possible and we have a, a new crew that uh, came in and we'll have another crew that comes in now and we're getting a lot of help from Governor Pataki and from right. all of the surrounding areas. We had the, we had the National Guard here last night to help, help with, the, uh, with the effort, with the recovery effort. Can, so can we're you, getting a great deal of assistance. Can it's, you tell me where this has left the city in terms of, I mean, what's open, what's closed, are roads in and out of the city open? The, uh, the four boroughs outside of Manhattan are all open, and they're all open for business and uh, operating, you know, as normally as you can operate in, in, in the wake of a situation like yesterday where there's an, there's a, an emotional reaction that you just have to acknowledge and realize is going to happen. Uh, Manhattan is closed from 14th Street south. Uh, Manhattan is open 14th Street north. Uh, for for business with the with the caution and recommendation to people that if you don't have to come in today uh, It's just gonna make things a lot easier with the right. relief effort if you don't so my observation coming coming down here uh, this morning was that uh, Things are pretty quiet in Manhattan today. I, I don't know how you answer this question but I have to ask you I mean obviously the city will recover physically, but but how does it ever recover emotionally? Uh, it becomes stronger as a result of this it becomes more uh, understanding of uh, the special role that the city, city of New York has. We're, we're a democratic society. We're open to people. We're a city that's built itself on immigration and on, and on tolerance and on caring for people. And it's a city that has a reputation of being able to handle the worst situations probably better than anything else. So we, we now have to be an example to, um, you know, to the rest of America and how, and how we handle this and how, how we show cowardly terrorists if they're not going to make us afraid. They All just right. can't do it. We're, we're you know, uh, someone said that the most visible symbol of New York were the, you know, the World Trade Center towers, and I, uh, it certainly was a visible symbol, but the most visible symbol in New York is the spirit of a free people, and we're going we're to show them that we can overcome this, and by reflecting on it and understanding what happened to us, we're going to be even stronger. Mayor Giuliani, we certainly appreciate Thank your you. time. We know you have a busy day ahead of you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. 21 past the hour. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you. Joseph Albaugh is the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Director Albaugh, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Katie. On Tuesday, I know that President Bush declared New York a federal disaster area. What specific role is FEMA playing in the recovery efforts and the cleanup? Well, immediately we activated uh, 12 urban search and rescue teams, four to go to Northern Virginia, to the Pentagon, D.C. area, and eight to New York City. Uh, I commend those New Yorkers. They are, have a resilient spirit, as the mayor said. They're working hard, but right now 
Folks have been working almost 24 hours and we need to give them relief. We're still in a response and recovery mode right now. Folks are still alive. We want to get them out of the building, and that's what we're focused on. As we well know from what happened in Oklahoma City, this could be a very long, drawn-out process. Do you have enough personnel on deck, if you will, to replace those who become exhausted at the scene? Absolutely. Not only do we have uh, our full-time employees, we have our part-time partners that are disaster assistance employees from all across the country, and then we have our neighbors, folks that we count on in time of any incident such as this. And uh, they're all across the United States ready, willing, and able to help. When you say neighbors, meaning? neighbors right next door. I mean, this is, this is an incident that, that, that brings the best out of Americans. Everyone puts aside their, their petty differences and rallies to a common cause. We'll get beyond this. It will take some time. It will be painful, but it will be done. So you're saying you might enlist the help of, say, firefighters, rescue teams, police officers from other jurisdictions throughout Absolutely. the country? Absolutely. What is your top priority right now? My top priority are to make sure that the mayor, Governor Pataki, who I spoke with this morning, have what they need. Those resources, those uh, individuals that need to assess, assist the city in, in this recovery effort. I'll probably be going to the Hill this morning, doing a legislative briefing, and then up to New York City this afternoon to make sure that the president has his eyes and ears on this subject. Director Alba, I know FEMA steps in in, in in disasters and national emergencies, but what unique challenges is this situation, uh, are you faced with in this situation? Well, our biggest challenge right at the minute, starting in about, uh, oh, 35 minutes, our 800 number will be open for those who need immediate assistance. That 800 number is 462-9029. At 8 o'clock Eastern time, it'll be open, making sure that folks have cash money if they need temporary housing, identifying those folks that need that assistance. And then the second thing we have to do is make sure we have the necessary personnel in New York, in Washington, responding to this disaster. So the FEMA helpline is should be used primarily because we don't want to overload it by people who may need housing assistance, but they for need, people who don't know of the whereabouts of their loved ones, that, that is, is not, not the number, number that they that should call. That is not a number to call. These are individuals who have been harmed. They need temporary assistance immediately. Let me give that number again. It's 1-800-462-9029. Also, correct. we have a couple of other numbers that I think we'd like to give. One for blood donations. How serious is the need? for blood donors well as you know yesterday uh, flights were grounded rightly so so that uh, harmed uh, our ability to get blood where we needed it folks if they can they should donate go to their local chapters I'm sure they're going to be sprouting up all over the United States we need blood to assist this disaster. in fact we have a number uh, of the American Red Cross 1-800-448-3545 Four, three individuals can call that number and find out where they should go to donate blood and for financial contributions director Alba I know that people can call the Salvation Army is that right Salvation Army American Red Cross uh, we have Catholic Charities uh, Baptist men we have numerous volunteer agencies which is what makes America so strong in its spirit as the mayor alluded to all right well FEMA director Joseph Alba director Alba again thanks very much for talking with us good luck you, in Katie. the days and weeks to come we Thank appreciate you. it Talk to you soon. Thank you. It is 726. Once again, here's Matt. Well, Katie, as we talked about yesterday, the need for blood is severe, and we were happy to report that here in New York, at least, and I'm sure in Washington and other places, people have been going to hospitals and blood donation centers lining up. That's right. To that is offer heartening. Blood. When the nation comes under attack, the nation, of course, rallies behind the president, looking for leadership and comfort. NBC's Campbell Brown is at the White House this morning. Campbell, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. The president is in the Oval Office. He's starting the day here with his national security team. The focus here now on getting federal aid to the thousands of people touched by these attacks and finding those responsible. The lights were on at the White House well after midnight as the president's national security team sifted through the latest intelligence, honing in on who was behind the attacks, preparing the U.S. response. In his address to the nation, the president issued a strong warning to any country that might aid the terrorists. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. White House officials say it was the president's decision to return to Washington. As Bush arrived at the White House, aides described his demeanor as somber but even keeled. His message to the country, American strength will overcome. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. 
America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. As Tuesday's attacks began, the president was preparing to speak to school children in Sarasota, Florida. He first got word a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center from Chief of Staff Andy Card, then a phone call from National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, then a second crash. Card whispered in the president's ear, Bush's reaction one of shock. Immediately, the Secret Service activated an emergency plan to protect the president. He took off on Air Force One, but his destination was kept secret. The plane became a flying command center, Bush's first call to Vice President Cheney. Cheney, Rice, and the president's national security team huddled in the White House Situation Room. But the scene outside on the White House grounds chaos as all other staff and press are rushed out in a mass evacuation. Fire trucks blazed down Pennsylvania Avenue. Crowds gathered in the streets as buildings nearby were evacuated. Air Force One brought the president to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where the president vowed to retaliate. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Minutes later, Air Force One took off again, the destination again a secret. Early afternoon, the plane landed in Nebraska at the U.S. Strategic Command Center near Omaha. Bush went into a bunker to talk to his national security team by live video conference. Fighter jets escorted Air Force One back to Washington. From the plane, he fielded calls from world leaders and spoke twice with First Lady Laura Bush, telling his wife he would soon see her at home. And security around the White House this morning is especially tight. Matt, the president is expected to be here throughout the day. He's invited members of Congress here to the White House later this morning for what the White House is calling a unity meeting. And then later this afternoon, the president and first lady will participate in a blood drive here on the White House grounds. The president asking all White House employees to donate. Matt. All right. Thanks, Campbell. NBC's Campbell Brown at the White House this morning. Now here's Katie. Matt, thank you. The president is expected to meet with his national security staff this morning. Secretary of State Colin Powell is just across the Potomac River at the State Department this morning. Secretary Powell, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Katie. On a human level, I just want to get your reaction to the events of yesterday. Uh, total shock. I was in a meeting in Lima, Peru with uh, President Toledo and his uh, associates when a note was handed to me and uh, I just shouted out across the, the breakfast table, oh my God. And then the situation got worse over the next 20 minutes as more reports came in and I immediately made plans to return to Washington. Before returning though, I did attend briefly a meeting of the Organization of American States where 34 other total states, the United States was 33, were assembled to bring into effect a new charter on democracy. And we did that by, by just a simple vote of acclamation. And then all of the delegates stood and applauded this statement in support of democracy and to show solidarity with the American people in this time of crisis. Since my return, I've been in touch with uh, leaders around the world, with Lord Robertson in NATO, with Javier Salon in the European Union, and Kofi Annan, to make sure everybody understands that we need a worldwide, worldwide response to this assault on America, because it's an assault on civilization. It's an assault on democracy. It's an assault on the world, and the world must respond as the United States plans to respond. Secretary Powell, last night the president said those who harbor these criminals will be held responsible if we believe the man behind this is in fact Osama bin Laden and that the Taliban, the ruling government in Afghanistan, is harboring him. What can the United States do to actually back up the president's words? Well, there are many options available to us, military options, diplomatic options, further isolation of any country that might be uh, harboring uh, who is responsible. We are not yet prepared to state this morning who is responsible, but the evidence is, uh, is mounting, and uh, I think uh, it'll point us in the right direction in the not too distant future. And then we will have to not only take action on our own part, but also mobilize the world against whatever regimes may be supporting the terrorists who conducted this act. So you're saying, General Powell, that as of this morning, you cannot say that U.S. officials believe Osama bin Laden was responsible for this? Let me just say that there is uh, evidence uh, being developed now, and uh, good evidence. We will be able to make a definitive statement in due course, but I think it is best not to speculate until we do have the evidence uh, all assembled 
and we make an informed judgment and announcement at that time. Secretary Pallet, diplomatic response may be seem meager to many Americans who in a poll this morning said 94 percent say they would support military action in retaliation if the U.S. can identify the groups or nation responsible. 92 percent said they would support it even if it meant entering a war. What is your response to that? I fully understand uh, the, uh, the views of the American people this morning. We're mad. We were assaulted. Uh, but our spirit wasn't assaulted and our fighting spirit was not assaulted. So we want to respond. You don't attack America like, America like this and get away with it. And so uh, I can assure the American people uh, that the president, if he is able to get the information uh, pinpointing who it is and where they are and get targetable information, I am quite confident that he will look at every option he has available to him to respond militarily. Along, the, along those lines, uh, is the U.S. government prepared to enter a war against these terrorists? And wouldn't that entail committing ground troops to find them, weed them out? After all, the U.S. has launched airstrikes against terrorist targets in the past, and the terrorists continue to survive, even flourish. Let's not think that one single counterattack will rid the world of uh, terrorism of the kind we saw yesterday. This is going to take a multifaceted attack uh, along many dimensions, diplomatic, military, intelligence, law enforcement, all sorts of things will have to be done to bring this scourge under control. And it is not just one organization, it's a network of organizations. We have to make the whole world understand that this is something we all have to be involved in and not just see it as a discrete response to a single incident. We'll do that. But we have to realize that terrorism has been around for a very long time and it's going to take a very long time to root it out. But what the president specifically was focusing on last night is that there are nations, there are states, there are organizations who provide havens. And these uh, states and organizations cannot be given a free ride any longer. And a uh, major part of our diplomatic effort will be to mobilize the international community against the actions of such states and organizations once we have a clear understanding of who is responsible for this and who might have been giving them haven. Do you think this was an individual cell of terrorists, or do you believe this could be state-sponsored? In other words, could Iraq or a country like that have been involved in this? Uh, I, I just don't know at this point, and I'd rather not speculate. I'm sure as the evidence mounts, we will have a better idea of, one, who is directly responsible, and two, what kind of support they may have been receiving from outside that cell, outside that network, from either state, spot, state organizations or other types of uh, terrorist organizations, but I'd uh, think it best we not speculate too wildly at this point. The U.S. spends billions of dollars on intelligence. Was this, in your view, a massive intelligence failure, as it has been called? I wouldn't characterize it uh, that way. We spend many, many billions of dollars on intelligence, and that intelligence uh, allows us to thwart many attacks. There are many terrorist attacks that never took place because of the fine work of our intelligence and law enforcement. Uh, experts, but in this case, we did not get the uh, the cueing we needed. We did not get the intelligence information needed to predict that this was about to happen or be aware of uh, of this kind of event coming our way. Um, so I think it's premature to call it an intelligence failure. Uh, let's see what we might have picked up as we go back and do the post mortem on how this all came about. Would you agree with your former colleague, General Schwarzkopf, that we need to emphasize human intelligence uh, as much as technical intelligence? And we've got all the technological toys that, that can be used for our, those purposes, but what we need are real thinking, seeing people on the ground to infiltrate <clears throat> these groups. Absolutely, but it's easier said than done. Um, and we do have to emphasize human intelligence because uh, you can defeat electronic intelligence just by not emitting. So human intelligence is very, very important. And I know that our intelligence uh, community is uh, very aware of that. But these are also difficult activities to penetrate and to be able to stay within such a network for a long period of time. But certainly this will be looked at as we review everything we're doing in the field of intelligence. If we do engage uh, in, an, in another country or take military action, what are the ramifications? In other words, if an Islamic fundamentalist group was responsible, what kind of uh, retaliation might we, we expect and what kind of access do they have, these groups, to weapons of mass destruction? Well, let me not uh, speculate as to what we might do. I think a uh, full range of options will be available and I know that the Secretary of Defense and his colleagues are looking at that. Um, 
it all depends on where we run this to ground as to what counterattack we might receive from uh, those who are responsible. But at this time, it's premature to start speculating or to identify them as Islamic fundamentalists. Let's just identify them as a terrorist group uh, that can have no religious underpinning, no, no legitimate underpinning for this kind of action. This is murder, which is against the tenets of every, every religion, every responsible religion that uh, is in the world. And it is receiving condemnation from around the world from people of all faiths and, and religious backgrounds. So let's just view them as what they are, terrorist organizations. Uh, and I cannot speculate whether they might have access to the kinds of weapons you've discussed because we don't know exactly who it is yet, but we'll be on guard for that. Secretary of State Colin Powell. Secretary Powell, I'm sorry to see you under such terrible circumstances, but we certainly appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. It is 7.38. Now here's Matt. And Katie, I've just been given a report, and I hope it's the first of many reports like this, but we're now being told that six survivors have been found in the rubble of the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan, one police officer and five civilians. Again, hopefully this will be the first of many such reports. And there you see the Statue of Liberty on what has turned out to be another beautiful morning. The irony was that yesterday was a sparkling, crystal clear morning before this terror took place in New York City and Washington and in Pennsylvania. NBC's Pentagon correspondent Jim McLeshevsky was at the Pentagon when that building was struck by a hijacked airliner. He's with us again this morning. Mick, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. It was exactly 22 hours ago now that a terrorist flew a passenger plane into the side of the Pentagon here. Firefighters continue to pour tons of water on the stubborn fires that continue to flare up. Unfortunately, grim news this morning. Rescuers report no signs of life underneath the tons of rubble. Once the fires are completely out and that damaged area deemed somewhat structurally sound, the number one task, recover the dead. Rescue workers using cadaver dogs work through the night on the grisly task of searching for the dead. Local fire officials estimate as many as 800 were killed, many still buried in the debris. The Pentagon, the center of America's military power, devastated by a sneak terrorist attack. American Airlines Flight 77 hijacked shortly after takeoff from Dulles Airport, with terrorists at the controls traveling at 600 miles per hour with 6,000 gallons of fuel. The jet slams into the two lower floors of the Pentagon. It kind of disappeared over this embankment here for a moment and then huge explosion flames flying into the air and, and uh, just chaos on the road. I hate to say it, but I did fall apart when it first happened. I was very frightened. Um, this doesn't happen in America. I guess it does. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was at work at his desk. I felt the, the shock of the uh, airplane hitting the building, uh, went through the building and then out into the area, and they were bringing uh, bodies out that had been Injured. The plane slices deep into the Pentagon, cutting through offices primarily occupied by the Navy and Marines. The upper floors later collapse. The question now, how will the U.S. military respond? Worldwide, American military forces are put at the highest state of alert, ThreatCon Delta. And even as part of the Pentagon burned, military planners continue to review the options. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Hugh Shelton, with a pledge to retaliate against those responsible. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next, but make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. The Pentagon has long had a number of contingency plans to attack a variety of Osama bin Laden targets. Those plans are now under serious review. The aircraft carrier Enterprise, headed home from the Persian Gulf, ordered to remain in the area in case President Bush orders military strikes. And the U.S. military is in already in action this morning. AWACS radar planes and fighter jets are patrolling the skies over certain areas of the United States uh, just in case uh, there are any additional terrorist attacks against targets here in America. And incredibly, even though the, uh, you can see the devastation behind me on the other side of the Pentagon, uh, employees here, military, civilian, are reporting to work. They're trying their best to make it look like business as usual. 
uh, sort of an act of defiance in the face of terrorism, Matt. Yeah, Mick, business as usual. However, as you mentioned in your piece, a strange fact is that at one side of the building, there is destruction, and at the same time, probably right now, there is planning going on in another side of the building. That's absolutely right, Matt. Uh, those contingency plans have been in place for a long time, and, uh, and given the, the very firm resolve and, and, and strong rhetoric from President Bush last night, uh, it's pretty clear to the, uh, to the military officials here uh, that they've got a job ahead of them. All right, Jim McLeshevsky at the Pentagon this morning. Jim, thank you. Okay, Matt. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you. NBC's Andrea Mitchell is at the State Department this morning. Andrea, as you know, I just spoke with Secretary of State Colin Powell. He did not feel comfortable saying outright that U.S. officials believe Osama bin Laden was responsible for this attack. But privately, what are they saying at the State Department? Privately, U.S. officials here at the State Department and in other places around Washington are saying that uh, there is no evidence at all that a state such as Iraq may have sponsored this. In fact, there is only one terror organization that they know of that has the means and the opportunity to mount something this massive, this well organized, and that person who leads that organization is Osama bin Laden. I think it is realistic. I think we have In the rubble of the disaster, clues possibly linking the attack to bin Laden, America's most wanted terrorist. Reports to the Senate that a member of bin Laden's group may be identified as a passenger on one of the four doomed planes. And reports of intercepted communications between his followers after the attack, talking about the targets being hit. A lot of things point to it. Was either, I would think it would either be uh, uh, Osama bin Laden cell or some other cell similar to it or kin to it or spin off from it. Why bin Laden? Method, motive, money. A well-financed global network responsible for the simultaneous bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania three years ago. Linked to the mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Also accused of plotting millennium bombings targeting Los Angeles International Airport. American tourist sites in Jordan, and a U.S. destroyer. Those plots foiled by counterintelligence teams. But six months later, disaster. The bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen last October. In this chilling bin Laden training video released in June, a chorus sings, quote, we thank God for granting us victory the day we destroyed the coal. Bin Laden himself is seen saying they charged and destroyed a destroyer. If it is bin Laden, can the U.S. finally track him down? He's a master of deception, harbored by Afghanistan's Taliban rulers for years, moving constantly, eluding the FBI. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but my expectation is that eventually there'll be a crack uh, somewhere in their armor, and, and we will determine who is responsible. Then, of course, you have the very difficult task of deciding how to respond and where to respond. And questions will be asked about the intelligence failure that permitted the terrorists to strike with no warning. It's true that we cannot have 100% success against suicide bombers who are prepared to take their own lives into their hands. But at the same time, particularly in a sophisticated operation like this, that there are lots of people involved, it needs a lot of coordination. And that creates opportunities for an effective intelligence operation. For weeks, Afghanistan has been warned that if bin Laden acted against America, America would act against Afghanistan. That warning repeated only just this morning by Colin Powell and, of course, last night by President Bush. So if there is evidence that can be built and a case can be made against Osama bin Laden. Katie, there is no question that America will strike Afghanistan and strike hard. Andrea, one reason apparently U.S. intelligence officials believe it was Osama bin Laden is that there was communications between bin Laden's supporters intercepted following the attacks. Uh, I guess words of congratulations along those lines. This according to Senator Orrin Hatch. What did they said about that at the State Department? Well, the officials throughout the government are very concerned that Senator Hatch said that publicly. They do not like to talk about electronic intercepts because that is the most secret aspect of what the National Security Agency does. But in fact, we have confirmed uh, Senator Hatch may not have spoken uh, wisely, but he was not misspeaking. There were intercepts as far as we've been told. And this is a pattern because bin Laden's organization also communicated electronically after the embassy bombings. That was a key factor in building the case. Mm -hmm. So they are building a case, Katie, as Secretary Powell told you. Well, let me ask you about another thing that Secretary Powell said, Andrea. He talked about diplomatic solutions. Realistically, what could be done diplomatically that would have any teeth at all or any impact? 
Well, they will respond militarily. He made that very clear, if a case can be built. But there is a role for diplomacy. Secretary Powell has already, as he said, been in touch with Kofi Annan and with leaders around the world. They have to explain the United States' position, particularly in a, at a time when, let's be frank, the U.S. is not widely loved in many sections of the world, in the Gulf, in the Middle East. So there will be a, a backlash, if you will, if it does turn out to be Middle Eastern terrorism. And he has to lay the groundwork for that and make the case that he was making this morning, which is that this is an attack against civilization. This needs a worldwide response. And at least from the initial response from, from China, from Russia, from Middle Eastern countries, moderate even leaders, Libya, even Libya, even and, Libya Iran and Iran condemn and these Fidel attacks. Fidel Castro, exactly. This is such a horror that I don't think it will be difficult, especially for someone like Colin Powell, to make this case. And in fact, he may travel to the region, is that right? Uh, we, it's not clear what travel he may undertake, but there have been suggestions that he may personally visit some other countries in order to build that case. But that would be obviously uh, most likely after a coordinated military response from the United States. NBC's Andrea Mitchell at the State Department. Andrea, as always, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. 748, once again, here's Matt. Katie, back here to New York. Doctors at St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan have been working around the clock to save the wounded. Dr. Richard Westfall is the Associate Director of Emergency Services there. Dr. Westfall, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, uh, we've just had a report, and I want to ask you to comment on this, that six survivors have been recently pulled from the rubble of the World Trade Center. What can you you tell me about that. Now, Mr. Lauer, I, I honestly can't tell you anything uh, uh, absolute about that because we have not gotten any additional victims since the early morning hours. We had two police officers about 3 a.m. who came in a rescue mission. They, uh, they came injured. They were not removed from the debris. So I cannot comment on those six. We've not gotten anybody here at St. Vincent's. They may have gone to other hospitals. All right, you're the closest trauma center to the World Trade Center. Give me your overall numbers so far. How many people have sure. you been treating? Over the past almost 24 hours now, we've had 375 victims that have been brought here. And of that, about uh, 53 have been rescue workers, uh, firefighters, uh, EMTs, paramedics, and police officers who have been injured have come here. We've had over 50 major traumas in the sense of uh, major fractures and, and head trauma and uh, loss of uh, consciousness. We've had four patients that expired at St. Vincent's in Manhattan here. Uh, two patients came in having CPR from a traumatic arrest yesterday. Uh, one of the first victims we got with a major burn expired during the day, and then we had a, a firefighter who was uh, brought out from a building around mid-afternoon who expired in the operating room. Uh, there was one other victim who was brought to one of our other seven hospitals by ferry. Twenty patients were brought to St. Vincent's in Staten Island, and one of those victims we told expired there. I understand that, that burns are one of the major problems, major traumas that you're seeing. Well, initially, uh, Mr. Lau, that's true. Uh, I'd say probably we had up to about 15, 20 major burns. And what we did since uh, the patients were brought immediately to the closest trauma center, we stabilized them, made sure it was just burns that they had, initiated treatment. And I can tell you that uh, I'm told that uh, yesterday evening, three of the major burn victims were transferred to from here to New York Hospital's burn center. Uh, they were very receptive and helpful as well. Dr. Westfall, I know that people, uh, civilians living in the area, have been coming down trying to drop off supplies and things that they're assuming the hospital may need, including clothing. Can you tell me what it is that you do need and what it is that you don't need? Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. At this point, in the beginning early hours, we needed everything, but I got to tell you, through the media appropriate, uh, trying appropriately, that message went all day and all night. We do not need any physicians and nurses. We do not need any additional volunteers at our site right now. Uh, I think what we all need are, you know, prayers and concerns for family members of loved ones that are, that are down there. But we don't need any exact uh, help that way. We've had local institutions that have been bringing us food, and our local Starbucks is bringing us coffee all night, and uh, we've had tremendous help that way. So I think... Uh, if everybody just, uh, you know, make sure that they're getting their, their proper care. I think anybody, I'll speak medically, anyone that has minor concerns of anxiety or post-stress reduction that's of a minor nature, they probably should contact their own physicians as the first line of defense today. But anybody who can't get to contact or see their physician, certainly they should come to their local hospitals. And we're at St. Vincent's in every hospital. And, Manhattan and the five boroughs, I'm sure, are very open right. to, to helping them. And, Doctor, I was just reading that, that some of the doctors and nurses who work at St. Vincent's, Vincent's are actually married 
to police and firefighters, and there was a lot of difficulty yesterday and then contacting their loved ones, which I can imagine was, was a horrible scene. Yes, it's, it's very hard. I, I, I think uh, I can mention that the nurses and, and, and some of our administrative staff that did have loved ones in fire and police that were at the scene and they could not contact, yes, there was a tremendous level of anxiety, but fortunately, uh, during the heat of the battle, everybody focused on their, on their mission of, of treating, stabilizing, triaging, patients and then uh, the rest of the hospital had areas that dealt with uh, families and questions that came in we had blood donations and one thing I can mention it'll be on TV it'll be publicized but they are taking blood donations but at the major blood banks I, I know at St. Vincent's and other hospitals you know uh, patients shouldn't come to donate blood but I would watch the notices on on your show and other uh, stations that well, they'll tell you where to donate blood at the major uh, New York City blood bank. All right, what you're saying is you don't want people to come down there and clog the hospital up when there's other work to be done. That's You'd rather correct. them go to the donation centers. Dr. Richard Westfall, doctor, thank you so much. I hope you see more and more survivors today. Thank you, Ms. Lauer. We do also. Thank we, you. We appreciate your time. Thanks. 53 past the hour. Here's Katie. Matt, the pre precision of Tuesday's attacks boggles the mind. Four simultaneous hijackings of U.S. airliners Air travel here will never be the same. NBC's Robert Hager is at Washington, D.C.'s Ronald Reagan International Airport this morning. Bob, good morning. Good morning, Katie. Well, there you see the idle planes at the gates. The plan, theoretically, is to resume flying. There's clearance to the airlines to fly as of noon today, but in reality, it's probably going to take a lot longer. For instance, here, they won't even be opening the terminal until 3 o'clock. So expect a very, very slow return to normal later on today and tight, tight security. As for the hijackings, officials now say that each plane was commandeered by three to five terrorists, probably killing the pilots and taking over controls of each of the planes using knives as weapons. Here then is what's known. Four planes, 266 on board, lost at the hands of suicidal hijackers who turned them into weapons of vast destruction. Boston's Logan Airport, an American flight with 92 aboard, supposed to fly cross country to Los Angeles, diverted to New York. A flight attendant calls from the flight on her cell phone. Chilling news. Her fellow flight attendants have been stabbed, she reports. Passenger cabin taken over, and they're going down in New York. Back in Boston, a United jetliner with 65 aboard is already in the air, also bound for Los Angeles, 18 minutes behind the first flight, when it, too, is diverted. A businessman on the flight calls his father twice. First call, a flight attendant has been stabbed, he says. Calls again to tell his dad the plane is going down. This is the actual video of that second plane crashing into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. In Northern Virginia, an American jet takes off from Dulles Airport. 64 aboard this flight headed to Los Angeles. On board, Barbara Olson, wife of the U.S. Solicitor General, calls her husband on a cell phone, tells him hijackers have taken over that flight with knife-like instruments, passengers being forced to the back of the plane, she reports. Moments later, the plane hits the Pentagon. And finally, Newark Airport, another United flight, 45 aboard, bound Newark to San Francisco. Hijackers turn it back to Washington, D.C., but it comes down en route in western Pennsylvania. Officials say it wasn't shot down, so hijackers may have crashed it too soon, or there could have been a struggle ongoing in the cockpit. Four deadly flights, says terrorism expert Neil Livingstone. I clearly call this a war. I think this is a wake-up call for America. I don't think we'll ever be the same after these attacks today. How much did the government know as it was happening? Pilots are able to send coded signals to controllers if they're hijacked, but it's uncertain whether any of these crews had time. Even if they did, controllers would have been frustrated, powerless to do much more than notify official Washington and track the plane's moves. Since most previous hijackings have ended without loss of life, it's a hands-off approach that's worked best until now. Finally, security. Former commercial pilot Jim Tillman. Airline travel across the world will never be the same. It particularly will be different in the United States. And what we have known to be open and free airports will change radically. Passenger screening, a special issue. Previously, unannounced testing has shown screeners miss even mocked up guns or explosives one out of every five times. And knives are sometimes even permitted through intentionally if they don't appear menacing. 
Today, the National Transportation Safety Board is sending investigators to the scenes of these various crashes, and they're helping the FBI search for the plane's cockpit voice recorders. Those are the recorders that record all the voices in the cockpit, and they could, if they're found, provide valuable information on who committed these horrible acts and why. Katie? Bob, so many questions unanswered this morning. So are you saying that the FAA or air traffic controllers might have realized while these planes were in the air that they were in fact being hijacked? In other words, did they get any word from the pilot? Were they able to trace the flight and realize they were off course? I think, yes, they would have seen that the blips were off course. Now, the way we've heard it, the hijackers had disabled the transponders on these planes. So what controllers would have been getting on the radar is a blip. They'd see that the blip was not where it's supposed to be, but the blip wouldn't have any identity on it, wouldn't have the altitude on it. Uh, they may also have gotten, as I say, these secret codes. But again, if a plane is being hijacked, the history of the hijacks, and they've been so rare, but the history of hijacks is they usually end peacefully. Nobody would imagine that one was going to be an act of terrorism where they're making this plane into a suicidal weapon. And so uh, the history being peaceful is that you sort of play hands off and let the plane go wherever the hijackers want to take it, mm -hmm. and then everybody's released and it ends quietly. So there's not a real history for how to deal with something like this. I mean, it just, just wasn't on their charts. And Bob, were, were knives apparently the weapons of choice on all these planes? I know that some have described uh, one of the weapons as box cutters. And how were they able to get those on the plane given airport security. You mentioned that oftentimes the, these are missed, but do, do uh, airline officials believe they might have even gotten some help inside on the ground with either cleaning crews or maintenance crews along those lines? Well, that's always a possibility. It's pretty early to tell whether that's involved in this or not, but chances are no, I'd say, if I had to guess, that probably they did go through the security. Now, sometimes knives are permitted. There's some rule about if the blade isn't longer than four inches, it's really okay to take it through. So it's kind of the discretion of those screeners whether the, the uh, knife looks menacing. Uh, for instance, people often take these little pen knives onto planes. Uh, so that's, that's one way they could have got it through security. And otherwise, uh, as you say, security quite often misses uh, things that are even more obvious than that. Well, obviously, security at airports is going to be reevaluated, to say the oh, least. Oh, you bet, you bet. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you also, Bob, we've heard stories of possible heroism on that plane that crashed in Pittsburgh that was en route, the United flight, I believe, from Newark there to one San report. Francisco. Yeah, there were people on the cell phone from that plane, and there's one report, somebody uh, calling a relative and saying, uh, we're going to go down anyway. Uh, hijackers had this plane. Uh, we're going to take them over and go down with it. Something like that to indicate that they were going to take on the hijackers physically in kind of an all-out life-or-death effort. So there is one story that they may have succeeded in overcoming the hijackers, but then been unable to fly the plane, and that's why it crashed. But that's they're very, very preliminary. It'll really help to find the cockpit voice recorder. And of all the cockpit voice recorders, that one out there in the field in Pennsylvania may be the first that they find. All right, Bob Hager at Reagan uh, National Airport in Washington, D.C. Bob, thanks very much. Thank you, Katie. Two of the planes that were hijacked and intentionally crashed took off from Logan International Airport in Boston. NBC's Chris Hansen is in Boston this morning. Chris, some major developments there so far. Well, that's right, Katie. Last night, federal authorities confirmed for NBC News that they believe there has been an active terrorist cell with ties to Osama bin Laden operating in the Boston area. Now, this morning comes word that authorities may have identified some of the actual hijackers, and here's how they think they might have done that. Yesterday, they got a phone call from a passenger who had left Logan and arrived at his destination. Of course, he saw on the television monitors what had happened at the World Trade Center. He called investigators to say that he had had an altercation with two men he described as being Arabic in the central parking garage near the American Airlines terminal here at Boston Logan. He described the car that they were near, which was a, turned out to be a rental car, a Mitsubishi sedan. Investigators arrived at the sedan, took a quick look, and they found inside that there were flight training manuals in Arabic. They were able to connect that sedan to two men who are now identified as brothers, both of whom who have passports from the United Arab Emirates, one of whom is a trained pilot. Now, there's been another development in terms of other suspects here, and that is that investigators now believe that two to three other suspects may have come across the border into the U.S. from Canada and flown here yesterday morning from Portland, Maine to take part in the hijackings. All right, Chris Hansen in Boston. Chris, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, 
You're reporting from there this morning. It's 8.01. Now here's Matt. Katie, thank you. Uh, L. Paul Bremer is former ambassador at large for counterterrorism at the State Department. Ambassador Bremer, good morning to you. Morning. When you think of an attack like this, is this something that would have been weeks, months, years in the planning? At a minimum, it's months, conceivably even years. As you've just heard, this is a very complicated operation that involved dozens of people and it's clearly a massive security failure at our airports and a significant intelligence failure in addition. Well, I, you know, I've heard count, uh, conflicting reports there, Ambassador Bremer, because I've heard some people say this was a large group, well-funded. I've heard other people say it may have been a much smaller group because a larger group would tend to slip up in communications. Well, we, uh, if, we, if what we are hearing this morning is correct and there were three to five hijackers on each of four planes, you're already in the 20s. And they had support people. They had to get in this country. They had to rent a car, as we've just heard. They had to get across borders. Uh, this is a very complicated professional operation. This is not something that was done by a group of, uh, of guys who just got together one day and decided to conduct an attack uh, two weeks later. Secretary Powell this morning talked to Katie, and he said that, you know, we have to remember that our intelligence does pick up and thwart many attacks aimed at the United States, but, but obviously we missed this one. What are the reasons, the basic reasons, in your opinion, that we may have missed this one? Well, let me make a couple of points. First of all, um, it is true that in this particular area, this is the most difficult intelligence in the world to collect against terrorist groups because the only way you can get it is to have a spy in the terrorist group itself who's willing to tell you ahead of time about the plan. Human that, intelligence. Yeah, and, and after all, that's the objective of a good counterterrorist policy is to prevent attacks. Now, it happens that the National Commission on Terrorism, which I chaired, looked at this question rather closely and found that the CIA is operating under restrictive guidelines in the area of recruiting these kinds of terrorist spies. And we recommended, recommended that those guidelines be rescinded. That was a year ago. We made that recommendation to the president and to Congress. And to my knowledge, uh, 15 months later, nothing has happened. Well, let me stop you there, because I want you to be more specific. What your recommendation was that, that it be allowed for the CIA to recruit more of the, quote, unsavory types, the people with criminal records, and use them for our benefit? That's right. You know, if you're going to get good intelligence on terrorist groups, you're going to have to pay, put on our payroll some people that are not very nice people. They're terrorists. By definition, they're criminals. They may violate people's human rights. They may kill people, indeed. But that's the only way you're going to get good intelligence so you can prevent this kind of horror from happening. I'm not saying that if our recommendation had been followed, this would have been prevented. Not by any means, because as Secretary Powell pointed out, we do have good intelligence. We do prevent attacks. The problem is, in terrorism, you can very rarely talk about the attacks you prevent. And when you fail, it's dramatic and obvious to everybody. And let me ask you one final question, Ambassador Bremer. I mean, it seems as if indication is, even coming from government officials, for example, Senator Orrin Hatch, that communication has been intercepted within the group that is supportive to Osama bin Laden. But is there a danger that we may jump to the conclusion that he's responsible and his group is responsible and not conduct a thorough investigation in all directions? I, I would be very surprised if the government jumps to any conclusions. I think they will follow the uh, evidence trail where it leads. Bin Laden is certainly the number one suspect, but the fact that they had uh, at least uh, four and maybe six trained pilots uh, means you can't exclude the fact that there might have been some state support here because you can't train airline pilots in the deserts of Afghanistan. You've got to find them somewhere else. All right. Ambassador Bremer, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And now here's Katie. Matt, thank you. Ann Curry is downtown near the scene of the, the terrorism where the rescue efforts are ongoing. And what's going on down there now? Katie, as you know, there was a map going on now outside and around the areas of the Twin Towers. People have been working all night digging 12-hour uh, shifts in some cases for the fire department, for the police forces. Uh, we've seen them come out exhausted. Well, there have been some reports which have brought, in a, brought a lot of happiness to the people who have been working all so hard all night. Some reports that some people have been rescued alive, and there are reports that five or six firefighters have been pulled alive this morning, as well as two Port Authority police officers. Uh, we were seeking confirmation of this information, and so we found Battalion Chief uh, Kevin Burns to ask him about this information just a few moments ago. What you said, we have heard a report that there have been people found alive in this building. What can you confirm? One person is confirmed so far. 
Do you know who it was? Was no. it a rescue person, a person who worked no in the building? We have no idea at this time. They were not able to identify whether or not it was a uh, rescue worker or a civilian. Have you heard the condition of the person who was found alive? The person alive? is alive. Do we know yeah, anything about injuries? At uh, this time, I have no idea. So we don't know how critically or where he was rushed or she was rushed? No, not at this time. Okay. What are you doing now to get more people out, and are you still getting cell phone calls from under the rubble? Not that I know of at this time. Not that you know of at this time? Correct. But we understood from this morning that there were some cell phone calls being received. You, you cannot confirm that. We were receiving cell phone calls, but we, we could not determine whether or not they were called us or not. Bogus or not, so they're right. ISIS, you're tracking those down. What are you doing now to dig people out? We have canine units in there, we have units in there, trying to find out people in the voids that are in there. How many people do you have digging? We have, I, I can't tell you. Hundreds of people digging? Of course. Police and fire? Correct. How far are they able to get in there with all the debris? Is there concern of collapse? There's always concern of collapse. But, uh, how far they can get in at this moment, I can't tell you. Hand tools with their hands. Anything we can do. I understand you also have cranes, however, donated from the Port Authority that you're actually lifting things with cranes. Is Correct. that true? Correct. How many cranes do you have operating? There's a, there's a multitude of cranes working. What's, what's pushing these guys on? What's pushing all of these people who are working so hard for so many hours on? Is there a strong belief that people will still be alive? Of course, of course. always hope. Of course. I have to go now. Thank you. Uh, your name, please? Chief Burns. Chief first name? That was Battalion Chief Kevin Burns. That was Battalion Chief Kevin Burns saying that there's always hope. That is going to now obviously encourage people even more who have come down here. And by the way, we should say that there are plenty of volunteers. We spoke to one who came down uh, yesterday at 10 o'clock. He has not left. They've been building stretchers out of wood. They've been mobilizing, uh, moving these stretchers around. And also, Katie, uh, they also, this is an interesting fact, they've gone into some of these federal buildings uh, all night last night. They were going into these different buildings searching for medical supplies. That's the level of desperation, searching for any medical supplies that they could bring out to create the triage units that they're still setting up here in hopes, in hopes that more people will be found alive under all of this rubble. Katie, back to you. All right, Anne, thank you very much. David Bloom is also near the scene. David, tell me what uh, is going on from your vantage point. Well, what we're told, Katie, is that they've rescued some firefighters. We don't know how many. We're live right now on the Today Show. Please, sir, if you could just come over here for just a minute. Thank you very much. Just tell me what happened. Uh, I just went up, went up by the World Trade Center to see exactly what happened. And um, in the process, I, I saw some, a lot of people digging out, trying to, you know, get somebody, like, they're digging out uh, people out of the um, rubble. And, uh, Eventually, when we looked up, excuse me, when we looked around, um, there was a guy on a gurney, and they wanted help, you know, wanted us to form a, a line to get him out so that he could get to, um, the ambulance. And um, I just got in the line and helped get him out. And according to one of the firefighters, he was buried for around um, nine hours. Now, where exactly was this? According, according to what I, what I remember of the World Trade Center, it was just the steps leading up um, to where they say it was a courtyard. I, th I think that's right where he was. And do you know whether this firefighter is one of several who've been rescued this morning? That's what we're hearing. I have no idea. Okay. I just noticed that one guy, and I was just happy to see that they got one person out. And what sort of shape was he in? He wasn't in, he wasn't in a bad shape. He wasn't really in a bad shape. Was he talking? Uh, no, he didn't talk, but he raised his hand. That was a good sign. Okay, tell me your name. Yeah, I'm Courtney. Thanks very much. Okay. So, Katie, that's the latest in terms of the rescues that are going right now on right now here in Lower Manhattan. All right, David Bloom. David, thank you very much. Now with more, here's Matt. Katie, it was devastating enough to watch the attacks on our country unfold on Tuesday, but for many Americans, the devastation hit much closer to home. Moments before jetliners were deliberately crashed, there were a series of chilling phone calls made by victims aboard those doomed planes. Alice Hoagland got one such call from her son. Ms. Hoagland, our condolences to you. Appreciate that. Your son, Mark Bingham, was on board United Airlines Flight 93. That's the plane that took off from Newark, bound for San Francisco, and the plane that eventually crashed in Pennsylvania. Can that's, you tell me? That's right. Can you tell me about the call you received? Yes, we got a call at about 6:45 in the morning yesterday. Uh, uh, for, the house is full of people because we just have new babies in the in the house. A friend answered it. Carol Phipps went and, and got Mark's aunt Kathy. Kathy spoke to him first. He told her 
I love you. And she said, Mark, we love you very much. And then Kathy ran and got me. And Mark said, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. <laughs> I love you. First of all, I want to tell you guys I love you. And I, I repeated, Mark, we love you very much. And, and he said, I'm on a flight from he identified it to Kathy as Flight 93, United Flight 93, of, of from Newark to San Francisco, and the plane has been taken over by three guys, he said, who, who, uh, who say they have a bomb. And I asked him, Mark, who are these people? And he didn't hear me, didn't get the, get the question, didn't answer it, was distracted. And I, I asked the question again. I heard some commotion in the background. Uh, Mark seemed to be talking to someone else or someone was talking to him. Uh, and then the, the, the phone went dead. He told me at some point during the conversation that he was not calling me with a cell phone. He was using the air phone, probably at his seat. Uh, we know from other sources that, that he was sitting in seat 4D, which is a first class on, uh, on this United flight. I, I'm a flight attendant for United Airlines, as is my sister Candace Hoagland, and Mark was flying on her companion pass. Uh, uh, that's how they knew to contact us. Uh, it's Ms. Ms. Hoagland, terrible. you say you, you heard some commotion in the background. Can you describe that for me? Well, uh, the FBI uh, has asked us similar questions, asked us if, if we heard Mark mention anything beside the bomb. Uh, he made no mention of knives or box cutters or guns or, or any other weapons. He mentioned the three guys. He wasn't able to get out word about their description, who he thought they might be. I couldn't make out anything distinct from the background. I was trying hard to hear his voice, which was coming over clearly when he was speaking, he spoke uh, fairly slowly, calmly, uh, although I could tell he was under a great deal of duress. After the phone went dead, Ms. Hoagland, how, how long was it after that, that that you heard that indeed that plane had crashed? The call came in about 6.45. We understand that the plane crashed about 7 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And so I guess, uh, Probably by the time we hung up, he hung up with us, or the phone went dead. It was about about three minutes that he had about 12 more minutes to live, I guess. Uh, we hope that Mark was able to take a proactive part in thwarting these hijackers. So we, I have hopes that he was able to. He was in a good position. He was, uh, he was forward in the aircraft. Could probably be in full view of everything that was going on. Probably w w saw what happened in the cockpit. He was very active. Uh, take charge, assertive young man. Uh, uh, we have it from other people, uh, uh, another man on the aircraft who called his wife, who said that they were, uh, he was, he and some other passengers were hoping to, to get at these guys somehow. So uh, this was the only flight of the four uh, that did not reach its target, which they believed to be Camp David, and that gives us reason to think that perhaps Mark was able to help save the lives of people on the ground. Yeah, there was another cell phone call made from someone who'd locked himself in a rear bathroom who said that yes. we're going to have yes. to do something because it appears we're going to die either way and we have to try something. I mean, it, it appears that something heroic did take place on that I, flight. I, I certainly, I firmly believe that. Mark has been in a clinch in, other, in times past and has come through with flying colors. He's a Cal grad, uh, uh, rugby player, very assertive guy, aggressive uh, uh, and smart. And, and we love him very much. We're going to miss him. I can only, um, I, you know, I think this might be a weird way to describe this, Miss Hoagland, but the phone call in some ways has to be thought of as a gift. Oh. It, we were very comforted to be able to get the news from Mark himself. Somehow it, it, it made it much easier to, to take. It's awful. It, it's a national time of mourning for all of us, so I'm just one of many, many people. We're, we're so touched by the words of our president, by the words of the Congress people hearing, hearing, hearing America being sung on the steps of the Capitol building, it's just profoundly moving for me. I'm, I'm delighted to see this rebirth of patriotism among the American people. We need to be strong and, and work together to overcome this hatred that's 
taken us over. Well, you are uh, amazingly strong given the circumstances, Ms. Hoagland, and uh, <sighs> uh, our, our condolences, our se severe and sincere condolences Thank to you, you and your family. Our whole family appreciates it very much. We're just, I'm delighted to be able to express to the world how much we loved Mark Bingham, my son. He sounds like an amazing young man. Ms. Hoagland, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wow. What a, what a brave and eloquent woman at a very difficult time. We should mention there has been a, some speculation that we've alluded to throughout the broadcast that somehow a few passengers on that United flight that ultimately crashed outside Pittsburgh were perhaps able to overpower the hijackers, that that plane perhaps was headed toward Camp David, even the U.S. Capitol. And Again, this is just speculation. Knowing what we do about the plans of these hijackers to hit some sort of significant target, it, it would be hard to imagine that a field in Pennsylvania would have been their chosen destination. Anyway, so again, she was extremely courageous to talk with you. The impact of this attack on America is being felt nationwide this morning, of course. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport this morning. Kelly, good morning to you. Good morning, Katie. We're actually on the outside perimeter because security is keeping us out. O'Hare is, of course, at times the nation's busiest airport with 2,500 flights in and out of here on a typical day. But today it is quiet and nearly empty. Security in place of travelers. One indication, the airport snowplow fleet has been brought to different service gates to block their entrances so that people can't get in. The trains that would normally bring travelers here restricted only allowing airport employees to enter O'Hare. Of course, the airport is preparing to reopen perhaps sometime today, but here in Chicago and around the country, it's an uneasy start to the day. A nation stunned but responding. Americans giving what they know they can. Blood. I'm here just trying to do something that might help somebody in New York City or Washington, D.C. And prayers. Out of this enormous evil, in God's own way and God's own time, some good can come. But no coming together, none of the usual crowds at airports. An estimated 200,000 air travelers nationwide grounded. From coast to coast, deserted terminals, diverted passengers. We were planning on a trip <laughs> up through the Rocky Mountain air, bit in Canada, and I don't know if we're even going to make it. Getting there by ground, slow too. Trains interrupted for hours. Amtrak just beginning to restore service. The impact even hitting drivers at the pump. Soaring gas prices reported in Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Illinois. Peoria, more than $4 a gallon. Terrorism fueling fears of a gas shortage. An abundance of caution at sightseeing spots around the country. Closed signs at Seattle Space Needle. Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell off limits. Minneapolis, the country's largest shopping mall, shut down. No stocks to buy, trading on Wall Street and at Chicago's markets closed again today. Oklahoma City, a place that knows much about catastrophic loss, closed its bombing memorial to visitors. Disney's theme parks, east and west, shut down, but planning to reopen today. Chicago's Wrigley Field and ballparks around the country empty. Major League Baseball calling off all games indefinitely. Six defensive backs for the National the Football League on. says it will decide within a day or two if games will go forward this weekend. Hollywood already pulling the plug. Jay Leno's studio will be dark all week. This Sunday's Emmy Awards canceled. A celebration and a comedy show would just not be something that would be appropriate uh, for this country this weekend. One kind of production running overtime. The nation's newspapers churning out special editions. Terror in bold print. In Georgia, state lawmakers halted their session. Debate giving way to song. A verse echoed at the nation's capital. And here in Chicago this morning, they're waking up to these headlines. Our nation saw evil and outrage. The disruption goes on here in Chicago downtown today. Getting around by car will be difficult. Parking bans are in effect, especially around any kinds of government buildings. 
at post offices here and around the country, of course, mail and packages have been unable to move. So that will be disruption for people all across the country. While everyone is encouraged to return to normal, to get back to their routines, certainly it's slow going. Katie? All right, NBC's Kelly O'Donnell in Chicago. Kelly, thank you very much. It is coming up on 822. Now here's Matt. Katie, thank you. William Cohen is the former Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, and prior to that, he was a Republican senator from Maine who served on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Secretary Cohen, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. I, I want to talk with you professionally in a second, but first emotionally, your reaction to the sight of that plane and the devastation it caused to the Pentagon where you worked for so many years. Well, obviously, one of uh, profound sadness, uh, rage, uh, and ultimately uh, resolution uh, that uh, we are going to respond and will respond in a very forceful manner. Uh, but I uh, worried about uh, such an event uh, during the four years that I was at the Pentagon with the proximity of uh, the Pentagon so close to that of National Airport. I worried that there might be a flight that could uh, have uh, crashed accidentally, run out of fuel, altitude, and also a terrorist attack. But it, uh, it's virtually impossible to protect the Pentagon from such an event given the fact that we have open skies. And so it's just, um, it was something that I worried about. And unfortunately, uh, my nightmare uh, came true when I uh, saw what took place. Millions of Americans, Secretary Cohen, are work waking up this morning in a, in a state of shock, but also concerned as to whether this is over. In, in your opinion, knowing the way these terrorist groups tend to work, is the immediate threat over? It's not over. Uh, and even if the, this particular threat, which is so massive and uh, almost unimaginable in its uh, dimensions, uh, there is more to come. And that's why I hope this will serve as a galvanizing uh, force uh, to consolidate the American spirit, much as we did after the bombing at Pearl Harbor, that the Americans knew that we were all in this together. And now the American people are all in this together with those uh, countries uh, and democratic loving countries who support us. We are all in this together because terrorism knows no geographical or continental boundaries. And um, I believe that spirit is there. We've seen evidence of it in the last uh, few days. Uh, and uh, from the Congress, uh, from the President, uh, from everybody, from world leaders. So now's the time for us to wage this war against terrorism because the terrorists are out there with trying to acquire weapons of mass destruction. And even though it was massive in its destruction yesterday, uh, they are looking to acquire chemical and biological weapons as well as nuclear. So this is not over. K Katie and I were talking a second ago, and this may be asking you to comment on something that's either super secret or science fiction or somewhere in the middle, but the Pentagon is supposed to be the most secure building in the nation. It's the heart of our nation's military complex. Is there no system within that building that could warn the personnel that something like this was coming? I mean the actual airplane approaching. It's virtually impossible. Uh, planes fly over uh, almost every 15 or 20 minutes, uh, virtually leaving a uh, uh, national airport. And it'd be very difficult under any circumstances uh, to uh, forewarn people inside that a plane was uh, either uh, losing altitude or being directed uh, into the Pentagon itself. We have very sophisticated, uh, certainly electronic uh, mechanisms in the Pentagon, but uh, it would be impossible to evacuate the building or to, uh, uh, to make a determination as to whether, whether a plane was uh, slightly off course because they fly directly over the Pentagon. You and I have spoken in the past about the, the fact that terrorism usually has two targets, one a physical target, the other an emotional target. What is the emotional impact of this nation's military complex, the Pentagon, being successfully struck? I think the emotional reaction is one of uh, rage, uh, one of determination, uh, one in which uh, the American people uh, now finally realize that uh, there is a war going on. It has been going on at, quote, lower levels. Now it's at a very high level, and I think you'll see the American people respond accordingly. But we have to understand this is a, a long-term uh, commitment that we have to make. It's not going to be over with one swift military response, but a uh, co co coordinated, comprehensive, international uh, effort to uh, really get at the, the forces that support terrorism, to allow these breeding grounds uh, to continue to, uh, to function, that supply them with, uh, with finance, with uh, moral support uh, for, and, uh, and physical support. That can no longer be allowed to take place. You mentioned military response. Obviously, military plans take time, and, and we don't have a, a, a culprit at the moment, at least a, a definite culprit, and we certainly don't have a target. But would it be safe to say that right now people in the Pentagon, military officials, are, are determining some course of military action? 
I think it's fair to, uh, to assume, and I would say also that there are a number of uh, contingency plans that uh, have uh, always been uh, um, in operation, so to speak, uh, or available for the national uh, command authorities. So I assume that they're refining those, they're looking at uh, what action uh, may be taken and must be taken, and uh, we'll have to await the judgment of the president and his team uh, to make that decision. But there are plans, and uh, I assume that they are being uh, scrutinized, refined, and, uh, and to make sure that uh, whatever we do, uh, it's, uh, it's appropriate, uh, that it's uh, well uh, thought out, that it's not uh, an irrational response, but a cold, calculating, uh, method methodological uh, support of, uh, of the president. Uh, mm -hmm that uh, this needs to be done very uh, methodically and, uh, and with ice cold calculation so that we understand that what we're doing and that there'll be no second guessing uh, later on saying, well, you reacted uh, with uh, an irrational response. We have to take uh, care, take pains, but also uh, show determination to, uh, to carry out this, uh, this operation. Two final questions for you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, as a former member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, how surprised are you that, that our intelligence did not pick up any advanced warning of this attack? Well, uh, we have to remember our intelligence uh, uh, services are very good. Uh, we also have been very lucky. Uh, and you cannot uh, guarantee 100% that you will always intercept or, or be able to uh, get uh, information uh, pertaining to these operations. But we have been successful on many occasions in the past. But we have to understand that it's very difficult, particularly we live in a, in a world in which there are leaks to the media, which compromise our security. There are traitors uh, who compromise our security. It becomes very difficult to develop that kind of on-the-ground uh, human intelligence, which would allow us to penetrate these organizations. It's not enough to have good uh, signals intelligence and uh, technical means. You have to have people on the ground. Very difficult in uh, those organizations uh, that uh, sponsor terrorism. So we've got to do better. We will do better. But it takes time, and it also takes a level of support uh, that we not tolerate or sanction or in any way uh, give uh, any support to those who leak information uh, to the mass media, which in turn right. makes it easier for terrorists to carry out their operations. And, and finally, there's been a lot of talk recently, Secretary Cohen, about missile defense and spending billions of dollars to put some sort of missile defense system into place. And, and this morning we're reminded once again that what it really takes is perhaps just an airline ticket to wreak havoc on this nation. Does it make talks of a missile defense seem a bit unnecessary? I don't think it means uh, it'll be unnecessary. Uh, I support a limited uh, system to defend against a limited type of an attack, but I've also always believed that uh, the most uh, probable type of attack we'll face is one uh, of a uh, biological or a chemical or something that can be delivered other than uh, through a missile. But uh, by virtue of, of this particular incident, doesn't mean that a national missile defense system isn't needed, but it may uh, require us to scale that back and uh, focus on those that are most immediate, those kind of attacks that are most immediate. Former Secretary and Senator William Cohen. Mr. Cohen, thanks so much for your time.